And do you go, uh, prefer going by Chris or Christopher? I don't mind, really. Chris okay. is fine. Okay. All right, cool. All right. We are live. Oh. Uh, <laughs> yeah, just started. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, today we'll discuss... Uh, Sorry, we have a live discussion with the 2020 Libertarian Party candidates, Spike Cohen, and Head of Lifestyle Economics at the Institute of Economic Affairs, Christopher Snowden. We're going to discuss uh, current COVID-19 threats to liberty. Uh, so, Spike, thank you very much for joining. And Chris, also, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you, Nazla. How are you? Good, good. Thank you for having us. Me too. Nice to be here. Nice to meet you too. Um, so today we're going to talk about the regulations around the world, especially focusing on the US and the EU aspects of it. And I think it would be interesting to start with the UK because I think they are rolling a new sort of soft lockdown again in the UK. What would you like to say about that, Chris? Uh, yeah, we just uh, last night, new measures were announced. They haven't been voted on yet, but they're almost certain to go through with the support of the um, the Labour Party. Um, so it's not nowhere near a full lockdown at all, but it's um, it's very much a step backwards that was more or less promised wouldn't happen. Boris Johnson, the Prime Minister, um, back in February, as he announced a very cautious exit out of lockdown, said that it would be cautious but irreversible. And then a couple of weeks ago, we had mandatory masks on um, public transport and in shops. And very soon, we're going to have masks in a lot of other places, although not pubs and restaurants, which is quite good. Um, plus vaccine passports, which the rest of the UK already has. Or at least um, Scotland and Wales already have and have made no difference there whatsoever. A lot of Europe already has vaccine passports and again made no difference whatsoever and there's no even theoretical reason actually why they why they would work but it's so you know something must be done this is something in response to the omicron variant and also there's guidance to work from home so it's nowhere near as stiff and draconian as we're seeing in places like um the netherlands or france yeah. but it's again i say it's a step backwards in the face of really very little evidence that there's any reason for the UK to be concerned. We've got very, very high rates of vaccination, very, very high rates of, um, of boosters being delivered. Um, so, yeah, it could, it could be worse compared to some countries, but uh, it doesn't feel uh, as if we're going in the right direction. Yeah, we're definitely going to talk about the other countries, what's happening. I'm from joining from Amsterdam. It's also not great here. Uh, but Spike, how is it going on in the US? Do you think is there a big fear about the Omicron variant or is it just another sort of like weapon in the arsenal of weapons of government? So first of all, in the US, it's such a hodgepodge of different reactions because we're a larger country and because we have more of a federalist system. So, for example, I'm in South Carolina where our reaction is that we're going to have the holidays and we don't really care about the, you know, we're, we're uh, th there are no mask mandates. There are no lockdowns. There are no, I think at this point, I don't believe there are even any restrictions to uh, capacity for uh, events or anything like that. Um, th there's no vaccine passports or anything like that. Whereas in somewhere like New York or Los Angeles, uh, they do have vaccine passports. They do have vaccine mandates. Uh, there is threats of returning to lockdowns. They do have restrictions on capacity um, and things like that. Uh, and they're also rolling out in certain school districts across the country uh, mandates for uh, the vaccine for COVID for children as young as five, despite the fact that uh, the fatality rate for COVID among any pretty much anyone under 18 uh, has been essentially zero. Uh, I think we've had fewer than a thousand COVID deaths. Uh, it's actually been less deadly than even the flu has been for that age group. Uh, and yet they're still doing a, a vaccine mandate for that age group. Um, so here it, it's not so much here. It's more of the political fight between those who want to see what's happening in places like Europe and those who want to see even the restrictions we have here going away. Um, so it, it's it's more more of that. Uh, I, I think I'd probably have a, a, a more um, like I said, I, I live in, a, in an area where we have next to nothing in terms of any kind of restrictions from government right now anyway, when it comes to COVID. But there are parts of the country that are every bit as restrictive or even more so than parts of Europe. 
Yeah, and also the Biden uh, started mandate for private businesses. But I think, as far as I understand, the Senate is expected to vote to roll back that mandate. And most of the people think that it was he crossed the line and he exceeded his authority. What do you think? So they are expected to pass something that's, uh, that um, that that uh, nullifies that. But at the same time, the courts have already knocked all those down, at least temporarily. So I believe the only mandate that actually went forward uh, was the one towards uh, those who are in the military. Um, but for federal contractors and employees, for the, the mandate for employees uh, of uh, more than 100 uh, private employees, employers with more than 100 employees, uh, and then the mandate for healthcare workers, those have all been blocked in various jurisdictions. So as of right now, uh, unless you are in the military, um, there is no vaccine mandate at the federal level. Uh, and I don't anticipate that there, there, there was no constitutional authority for the president to order those things. Um, and so I, I do suspect that even if the Senate doesn't act, I don't think they'll get it past the courts. Makes sense. And when it comes to mandates in Europe, we're talking about much harsher mandate rules, actually. Uh, Chris, you probably know better. Uh, von der Leyen also suggested that there could be some sort of a vaccine mandate. The EU leaders started talking about mandates, even though they denied it completely last year. Uh, what do you think? Well, look, we see, we see this slippery slope, and we've seen it throughout the the pandemic. Unfortunately, even though we started off in a very liberal way with the with the with the lockdowns, which I think are more defensible than a lot of uh, libertarians. Um, would maybe give them credit for, but the slippery slope on vaccines, it, it defies it defies the science apart from anything else. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm instinctively against vaccine passport, uh, vaccine mandates. I'm against vaccine passports too, for that matter. Um, but I, I, I do recognize the tricky ethical issues when you're dealing with with kids and, and measles and so on. You know, um, I've never really been able to make up my mind exactly how I feel about um, the issue of vaccinating kids with you know very very safe. Um, uh, very very safe vaccines for really quite potentially dangerous diseases but as spike said you know covid is not a dangerous disease to the overwhelming majority of children and in the yeah in the uk when we were coming out of lockdown we were talking about vaccinating about 15 million people who were above the age of 70 and were vulnerable then it went down to the over 50s which i thought was probably fair enough then it was the over 30s. And I don't just mean making them available to people. I mean, like saying we're not going to come out of lockdown um, fully until all these people are vaccinated. Then it became all adults. Then it became everybody over the age of 12. And now it's become the uh, five and overs. And it probably end up being toddlers getting, you know, all three jabs before you know it. And again, kids, it was like one one jab for kids enough, you know, and then it was two. Maybe it'll be three sooner or later. Now, look, part of this just comes down to the science. I don't plan to be an expert on on the science of it all but then you move on to in our case in the uk uh you can't work in a hospital unless you've been vaccinated you can't work in a care home unless you've been vaccinated we've seen care homes closed down as a result of this now this isn't just a kind of a liberal libertarian issue this like i think most libertarian issues in practice because we want the world to be a better place it's a consequentialist issue yep. what really is more dangerous having a small number a relatively small number of um, medics, doctors, nurses, or what have you, working in hospitals who are unvaccinated, given that you can quite easily spread the virus if you're vaccinated yourself, or having to sack a huge number of, um, a relatively huge number. I mean, in the UK, I think we're talking about 100,000 out of 1.4 million people working in the National Health Service, having to sack all those people. I would say that, you know, just from a purely consequentialist point of view, it doesn't make any sense and it's, it's counterproductive to be sacking people in a health service that is already suffering from chronic staff shortages. But we see this go on and on. And now we're seeing it, as you say, at the EU level, they're talking about making it mandatory. We've seen in various countries, including Australia, no, no jab, no job. Um, I think even if there were good scientific grounds for that, I think it would be still very, very ethically dubious to do it. But as far as I can tell, there's no scientific grounds either. I think what we're seeing is governments putting all their hopes in these vaccines, as indeed I did, really, you know, as the as a route out of this. The vaccines, they're not quite living up, up to expectations. I mean, they're very, very good, and I recommend people get them, but I don't think many people expect them to wane so rapidly. I don't think 
many people expected them to be so quote leaky you know i think i thought most people maybe thought they were more sterilizing like a lot of vaccines we're used to and so rather than just accept that and say well look everybody who's got a vaccine uh so everybody who wants a vaccine has had a vaccine and we're not going to hold up society for the sake of people who aren't going to get vaccinated and you know, six-year-old kids don't really matter very much either way. They just double down on this vaccine, like more vaccines, more vaccines. The third jab, third jab, to be fair, makes sense. But, you know, fourth jab, fifth jab, vaccinate everybody. Sack them if they don't get vac vaccinated. It's this kind of desperation to having found something that really is a solution to think, well, maybe if we just do even more of this, we'll do twice as much of it, three times as much of it, then we'll um, we'll, we'll, we'll bring this to an end. And uh, unfortunately, you really get very rapidly diminishing returns not with the third jab i should stress which is really very important particularly for the omicron variant but just for like mopping up the those last few percent of people who yeah. are refusing to take the vaccine and probably will not take the vaccine no matter what you do they'll just become unemployed yeah to and me it sounds go ahead oh, i'm please. sorry go ahead no no, no i w i was gonna say so especially when it comes to the healthcare field one of the few places in South Carolina where if you go in, everyone's wearing a mask is in a doctor's office or a hospital or an ICU, uh, especially in, you know, uh, an emergency unit or in a, in a hospital. Not only are they wearing masks, but they're wearing face shield. They're wearing full Tyvek uh, protective outfits. Even if they had uh, the Omicron variant in that moment they wouldn't be able to spread it to anyone. They're wearing N95 masks. They're wearing face shields and everything else. It's functionally impossible for them to get or spread anything, at least in that hospital setting. And since we know that the vaccine doesn't stop people, as, as Chris said, from getting or spreading COVID, then it makes no actual sense to even do that, even if you don't believe from the libertarian standpoint, uh, even like, like he said, from a consequentialist standpoint, it just doesn't make sense. You would instead... Uh, fire the 10 to 20 percent of healthcare workers that are not getting vaccinated either because they can't or because they don't want to and cause hospital shutdowns like we're already seeing across the country and indeed in other countries as well. But but that goes back to the problem with government solutions is that there's a perverse incentive for government to at best do nothing and at worst make things worse because then they can grandstand on the suffering that they create and push for even more money, even more control, even more power, even more orders. So there's actually a, an incentive for them to do nothing but safety and security theater uh, and scapegoat the inaction or disloyalty of those who don't go along with it instead of just acknowledging that these things aren't working. Uh, especially with the Omicron variant, uh, it's likely that the vaccines are that much less effective in stopping people from actually getting COVID and, and spreading it. Certainly, it keeps makes them less likely to end up sick or in a hospital, but that makes it a personal health choice. Uh, I, at this point, government needs to make one of three choices. And, and I, when I say government, I mean around the world. Governments need to decide, are they going to continue to um, you know, put a false hope on trying to get every single human being vaccinated, which isn't going to happen? Are they going to create the segregated societies that we're seeing more and more where it's, you know, uh, vaccinated people get to go and live their life this way and unvaccinated people have to live this second class standard of life, even if they're unvaccinated for reasons that they actually can't get vaccinated? Or are they finally going to acknowledge that at this point, this is a personal health choice. They've made it widely available. Everyone has made up their mind one way or another. The only way they're going to get anywhere <laughs> is through education and encouragement and then let people make choices for themselves. And I, I hope that as we become more um, acknowledging of the fact that this is not a pandemic, it is endemic, it's not going away, we need to allow people to live their lives. I hope that's the direction that we're going to be going. Yeah, but I was going to say, it's like actually very much on the same line it's it's more like government is trying to externalize the cost by making everybody mandating everybody get the vaccines as soon as somebody doesn't get it that's the, that person is the problem or like these people are the problem instead of actually government action uh but that's not the first time we see this especially as libertarians i think we're very much aware of those those type of government actions well yeah. see there are two types of externality here you know and one is the very obvious one which is that you can spread a virus and you can potentially kill someone just by going around the place um breathing and you know and that is a classic collective action problem if you like it's certainly a classic uh, negative externality and i don't know about everybody watching this but you know i see libertarianism really is just being applied economics and i look at this whole issue through the lens of economics and i think 
uh, with normal kind of market economics can acknowledge externalities and can justify government action. If you're trying to avert a genuine crisis, I, I think we were in Britain um, back in March 2020 and also again December, January uh, 2021, um, then I think you can justify things up to and in, including lockdowns, um, partly for that externality, but also for this other externality which is hospital capacity. And in the UK, we have a particularly poor health service. It's totally owned by the government. Uh, and it's um, it, it has way too few beds in the, in the in its efforts to kind of become efficient and make sure that everybody has to wait in line. And uh, it's not even equipped for a normal flu season. You know, literally every single winter there is a crisis in the NHS and people say it's falling apart, it's on the brink of collapse and so on. And that, that is that is unfortunately often true. You know, people think nothing of waiting four or five hours in the emergency room in the UK. So it's totally unequipped for a pandemic. And um, so then again, you have a you have a negative externality that if if a load of unvaccinated people in this current situation are suddenly getting the virus, getting really ill, going to hospital, getting free treatment, as is their right, then if I get hit by a bus and crack my head open and need to be in the emergency room, I can't get there. I can't get intensive care. So that's more of a, in a way, it's an induced externality because I've been forced into this this state-run, you know, inadequate system. But it's still a, a kind, it is certainly an ex externality of some sort. And that is now what's being pushed. And of course, it's not this Britain that's, that's doing this, but we're being constantly told the health service is going to collapse. The health service is under strain. Yeah. Uh, and the only answer to that is us changing our behavior. And that's what worries me a great deal about this whole situation, particularly, as I say, coming from Britain, where the NHS is always under strain, is that if behavior modification becomes a solution to health service pressures, then for us, at least, there really is no end to it. Fair enough. Uh, also, uh, we had a question from our audience, which I think would be interesting to Chris. So what do you think about the number 10 parties and how Boris Johnson would respond to the scandals? OK, so I, I should explain for international viewers please, that, please that it, it, it is alleged and it does seem uh, fairly likely, to say the least, <laughs> that Last December, when um, there were very, very heavy restrictions around the UK, it wasn't quite locked down, but very, very heavy restrictions, including not being able to meet people from outside your your family um, in more than a groups of six. That at, at, at the Prime Minister's house in Downing Street in London, there was a party involving several dozen people, at least. This was initially denied by the Prime Minister, um, and then a video emerged of it seemingly somebody, uh, the, the actual press secretary um, of the government, uh, seemingly admitting to it. Now, the, um, the, the whole question of COVID restrictions, what we call Plan B, which is the vaccine uh, passports and the working from home, the stuff I mentioned at the start of the webinar, that uh, seemed on Tuesday morning to be not on the table and the government was quite happy with the way things were going and said so. By 6 p.m. on Wednesday, Boris Johnson was announcing these new measures. And there is a suspicion, which I certainly uh, am sympathetic to, that this was really a way of distracting attention from this scandal. And it has turned into a scandal, this, this Christmas party last year, because people really hate hypocrisy and they feel it's extremely unfair of course that you know we had people who were you know dying alone in in, in large numbers we had the queen yeah. this year who had to sit by herself at the at the funeral of a husband of 60 70 years um so this is a genuine uh, scandal and people don't like lying either in politics and uh, there seems to be some of that going on so was it because of that that the government brought in these restrictions well certainly it was a very hastily cobbled together announcement, as far as I could tell. Um, but on the other hand, if I'm being too cynical, and it really was that the government had been getting this advice that Omicron is going to collapse the health service and, and kill everybody, I don't think actually that's much better. Um, in a way, I, it's kind of like the old C.S. Lewis thing about Robert Barron's. I'd kind of rather have a dishonest government <laughs> who, who doing things, um, you know, pulling stunts to 
get bad news off the front pages than have a government that is going to start immediately restricting people's freedom every time a new variant comes along. Because we know new variants are going to come along all the time. Um, and the government, in this country at least, had put a lot of people's minds at ease in the summer by unlocking when we had very high case numbers still and saying that's the end of that. And, you know, the, the COVID crisis was March 2020 to July 2021. And that's it. We're getting back to normal life. Now, if it really is the case that it had nothing to do with this Christmas party scandal uh, and they, they generally just want to, for the sake of caution and being prepared, are happy to enforce all sorts of rules and regulations, then there really is, again, there is no end in sight for this because as um, as Spike's already said, look, this is an endemic virus. Everybody's yeah. going to get it sooner or later. I'm not sure that message had got through to people yet. Perhaps if if, if everyone understood that, people might be a, a little bit more uh, laid back and, and neurotic about this in a funny kind of way. But you know, that's where we are, and we, we cannot be panicking every time there's a new variant. And the incredible thing about that, specific to this this possibility that you know in, in at Ten Downey they were having these parties, we already knew that politicians think that they're above their own orders to us. You know, rules for thee, but not for me. That's that's nothing new. It's the fact that they told us that these orders are necessary to protect everyone's lives, including our own, and yet they the first opportunity they had, or or an an opportunity that they had, they immediately flouted their own orders. We already knew they thought they were above their own their own rules and their own orders. This demonstrates that they didn't even think these orders were necessary, because if they actually believed that forcing everyone to remain alone during the holidays was actually going to stop COVID or even greatly slow COVID, they would have done it even without the order to save their lives and the lives of others. Boris Johnson's not a spring chicken. In fact, he ended up getting COVID uh, and was in the hospital and was uh, getting uh, oxygen and everything else. I would assume that 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 particular Christmas party probably skewed a little older. So these are the people that are the most likely to have to worry about it. And this was before the vaccine. So, you know, it, it goes to show that they don't believe their own orders make sense. It's just safety theater and security theater to throw at us. It's also telling that their response, if it is indeed true that the reason they're doing this, uh, this kind of hastily put together vaccine mandate uh, is in order to distract from this scandal or possibly something else, this is once again, they're punishing you. The fact that they had a party and the fact that COVID uh, apparently doesn't uh, you know, check the papers to see what the orders are today, it just continues to spread because it's a highly virulent virus that with each new variant becomes even that more virulent and that much more easy to spread. Uh, that That's not why. It's because of you. It's your fault that, you know, you didn't you and every single other human being in this country or on this planet haven't gotten vaccinated yet, even though it's funny with Omicron, the first four or five cases uh, of Omicron that were detected and confirmed actually came from vaccinated people. Um, and I mean, we can go into many different, you know, the the disincentivization that just happened there where South uh, South Africa was the first country to acknowledge that Omicron exists. And they got rewarded with travel bans from around the world for it, uh, thereby ensuring that especially the poorer and less developed countries are, are much less likely to uh, report a new variant because they know that it will result in them being punished for it. Um, but I mean, this just goes to show I don't believe that the people that are actually in power actually believe these orders are doing anything other than giving them something to say well we're trying everything we can well it, it doesn't work and they know very much agreed and i think one of the things that governments in the beginning of covid they did very effectively is creating tra travel bans to stop the spread if i i assume everybody remembers like you couldn't go uh, anywhere else and if you were happen to be an immigrant or live in a different country than your own, you wouldn't be able to even leave your house. Um, and that we did all of that to stop the spread, but there were a lot of bands that didn't make sense. And like it, especially in the beginning of it, the, the whole map of people who can travel to the other country it looked very much like, uh, maybe it doesn't make sense to spike, but like the Eurovision Song Contest, like people who, uh, countries who like each other, they were opening the borders but people, uh, countries that didn't like each other, they were closing borders without any really good example or reason. It was so, a political thing, yeah. Yep. Yeah, it was completely political. It didn't make sense. Uh, 
at the time I was living in Turkey. So it was impossible to travel anywhere from Turkey because it's a, it's a travel country anyway. Um, but I do want to talk about the hazard of heavy handed responses. What do you think are the risks? What are the risks we've already seen? What do you think could be the potential future risks? So question to both of you, whoever wants to go first. Well, I mean, I spend a lot of my time, have done for over a decade now, writing about uh, public health. Um, and I, w I would answer the question that I think there's there's risks and opportunities here. And I've already mentioned the risks about closing down the country to protect the National Health Service. Let's assume that, that is not going to happen as such. Um, most of the stuff I've written up until COVID-19 was trying to explain and argue that most of the things that are described as public health threats and problems are not actually public health problems at all. They are private health problems that have been rebranded as public health problems in order to justify government action and to it would suggest that government intervention is necessary when it when it really isn't. And people come up with all kinds of spurious reasons to try and make people's personal behavior or other people's business. And that's usually just because they like putting their nose into other people's business. Um, you to, for example, you will often hear that obesity costs the health service a huge amount of money or smoking costs a huge amount of money. And it's, it's, it's nearly always untrue. And insofar as it is true, it's, it's kind of irrelevant since we, you know, we, we all pay taxes and health services aren't there to be engines of social control. Um, so the, I, the threat and the opportunity, I think, are uh, that in the future, having accepted a very large degree of government intervention on this genuine public health issue, the people who work in, in public health will conflate infectious diseases with issues like smoking or vaping or drinking or even gambling that sometimes they talk about now as being a public health issue. Um, and I've already seen evidence that during the course of the last 18 months, people will say, well, uh, you know, X number of people have died from COVID, but even more people have died from smoking or that there's a pandemic of, a, of obesity and the vector of disease is a food industry or, 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 you know, this kind of rhetoric, which they were doing a bit before the pandemic. But now people have really got on board and understood what it means for the government to control your lives for paternalistic reasons. Um, then I suspect there's going to be more of that. The opportunity however, is that actually I think a lot of people understand why we tolerated a great deal more government control when it came to COVID than we, we would do for any kind of lifestyle uh, disease um, or lifestyle-related uh, disease. Um, and you actually hear, I have seen a lot over the last few weeks and months, um, people who are essentially you know, an anti-vaxxers, uh, COVID deniers or what have you, they've been trying to pin the responsibility on obese people because there's a link between severity of COVID-19 and obesity and they just flat out deny these guys that um that the hospitals are, you know have a disproportionate disproportionately large number of unvaccinated people they say no it's got a disproportionately large number of obese people we need to go after the the, the obese people now that's a minority view and it needs to stay a minority view and I think the fact that we've had for the first time really in, in in most people's lives a genuine public health issue means it should be possible for us in the future to really mark a distinction and say yeah we we did accept these restrictions on our liberty due to genuine negative externalities during the covid19 pandemic but that's because it was a genuine public health issue and obesity and people drinking sugary drinks or smoking cigarettes or drinking whiskey, whatever it may be. These are separate, distinct private health issues. And there's no reason whatsoever to accept government intervention, unless there's some kind of market failure, which uh, there normally isn't. So I see, as I say, I see threats and opportunities. I'm naturally very pessimistic about the the, the state of the world and people's um, attitudes towards liberty. So I, I fear that there's probably a greater threat there and that you'll hear people, as indeed Boris Johnson did. I mean, Spike just mentioned Boris Johnson was in hospital with uh, with COVID, apparently in a, in a reasonably serious condition for a couple of nights. He came out of hospital. Once, once he recovered, he decided that it was because he was overweight that he had such a bad time, whereas some of his cabinet colleagues um, who were a normal, healthy weight, as they say, had uh, got off scot-free and there may even possibly be some kind of truth in that we'll, we'll of course never know what the counterfactual was but he then 
uh, use that to bounce through a whole load of nanny state policies in relation to food and banning so-called junk food advertising and um, uh, telling shops where they can position certain types of food and so on. So in that instance, Johnson did use uh, COVID-19 as an excuse to bring in nanny state laws that he's not, he's, and he's not a natural nanny status, Boris Johnson, or hasn't been until quite recently. So, yeah, I'm, I'm afraid I think we're going to hear more about the obesity pandemic and the sugar epidemic and all this kind of stuff to make people think that these issues are all basically the same when they absolutely are not. And people like ourselves need to be using the example of COVID-19 to give people a very clear and obvious example of something that is a genuine public health issue to explain why the West, rest of the month. Yeah. It, 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 whether this becomes, whether we face the risk or the opportunity comes down to who wins the the, the battle on messaging. And, um, you know, because anything can be skewed to be whatever you want it to be. Uh, if we allow the status and the people that are in charge, the status quo to say, well, the reason that we weren't able to stop COVID, the reason that I'm talking, you know, years from now when they stop saying until the pandemic's over, when they finally acknowledge that COVID's not going away, COVID waves are going to be a part of our reality from now on. Um, when that happens, you know, they're inevitably going to say, well, this is because you didn't all, every single one of you get your your booster shot every 2.5 months. And it's because you didn't, uh, you know, you, you didn't lock down. It's because you stayed uh, I saw that one time you were, you know, five and a half feet away from someone instead of six feet away. That's why COVID is continuing to to spread around the globe with, you know, umpteen variants uh, at all at various given times because of you. It's because of you. It's not because of us. It's because you didn't let us have even more control. And in fact, uh, for future pandemics and future epidemics, and we're noticing that word pandemic and epidemic being used more and more to describe things like climate change which is a, a, a environmental issue it is not an epidemic or pandemic. It's not disease related at all. Uh, in the U S we were told that white nationalism uh, is now an epidemic and a, a public health issue. Uh, gun violence, also a, a public health issue. These things are, have nothing to do with health, but they are using these terms because they're loaded terms right now. Everyone's scared. So if you can now, you know, they, they were using global warming and climate change. They couldn't really get people scared by calling it, you know, a threat to our environment and a threat to our, our, our safety. Uh, so now they can say it's an epidemic. Conversely, we have an, a, an opportunity to show we are watching firsthand how government and again, I'm speaking broadly when I say government, the governments of the world, especially in the developed world, they responded to a a, a, a true public health issue, as, as Chris said, a, a something that affected everyone, rich or poor, whatever color, whatever nationality, it spread everywhere. They all reacted largely the same way with haphazardly put together plans uh, often that were made for something else. Our lockdown uh, criteria was designed for the bird flu if it were to ever cross the barrier into human-to-human -human spread. The bird flu has a roughly 80% fatality rate. So we were using a criteria that had been put together during the Bush administration for something that was roughly 80 to 100 times more deadly uh, than COVID is. Certainly at least 80 times more deadly, um, just to put that in perspective. But they they used these plans which failed. It didn't work. It was not effective. Um, and we have an opportunity to say, look, we had lockdowns, we had mandates, we had all of these things, and it continued to spread whether you were in an area that had little to none of these things or whether you were in an area that had all or most of these things, it continued to spread with little to no regard because it turns out that COVID does not read the paper or watch CNN or watch BBC. It doesn't check for the newest COVID updates and, and guidelines. It just spreads and replicates because that's what viruses do and that there was no way to for government to stop that from happening. Um, and so we have an opportunity to, to push back, not just on, on COVID, but on future actions like this to say, for example, when they, when, when they inevitably say, well, the next pandemic or the next epidemic or public health issue that we have to deal with is climate change, we can effectively say, oh, what's your plan to do a bunch of stuff that 
accomplishes absolutely nothing and doesn't stop the actual thing that we were trying to stop from happening from happening uh, and instead just causes uh, a bunch of auxiliary human suffering as a result of your bad ideas. Um, so we we have to fight back because the if we don't, the uh, we're going to see the, the creeping authoritarianism that was already happening before COVID and has now been completely ramped up during COVID. So, you know, it really depends. There is obviously both risk and opportunity and which we see uh, is going to depend largely on taking the narrative and seizing the narrative and 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 not giving it like chris said don't give into the narrative of saying well if you're going to restrict someone restrict the fat people because anytime you give government a, a weapon it's going to end up being pointed at you don't blame it on immigrants don't bring blame it on on heavy people don't blame it on the elderly don't blame it on this group because inevitably this group is going to work its way back to you. In Austria, they introduced, uh, this was what, last month or the month before, they introduced lockdowns for just the unvaccinated. And there was great outcry among the people that are against this kind of segregation of society. And those who were in favor of segregating society said, yes, that's good. They should do that everywhere. And then I think even before they implemented it, Austria said, Actually, no, it's for everyone. Lockdown for everyone. And the people in Austria were very, very, very upset that they had been told it was just for the unvaccinated and now it's for everyone. Outside of Austria, people went, yes, no, that's good. We should definitely, that's what they should do. If we don't recognize that they're dividing and conquering us, and if we don't keep blaming each other for this, blaming the fat, blaming the unvaccinated, blaming the elderly, blaming the vaccinated. I see in some anti-vax people that are trying to blame vaccinated people for the spread of, of COVID or, or these variants. Stop blaming each other. Recognize that this is something that was going to happen regardless. And look at the people that are trying to seize upon this to have even more power. If we do that, then we can win this. The shall come together and blame the Chinese Communist Party. <laughs> that also happened in the beginning, though, calling it Chinese virus was Trump, one of the Trump's strategies. Mm. Yep. And the travel ban from China, even though it was. So I remember. So with Omicron, we watched this. Hey, everyone, uh, there's this new uh, strain of of, uh, of COVID um, and it's called Omicron. We're calling it Omicron. And uh, it's uh, originated in South Africa and or one of several uh, Southern African countries. Uh, it's already everywhere. Uh, it's already in on every continent. Um, and it spreads. It appears to spread even more uh, wildly than the other ones did. And uh, reinfection even for the vaccinated seems very high. So what we're going to do is ban travel from those handful of countries that we're pretty sure it originated from, even though it's already everywhere. And there were people that were in an uproar about it. Now, in the U.S., things are decided by many Americans, whether it's a Republican or a Democrat doing it. And I watched a lot of people who last year, when COVID was already here and Donald Trump announced a travel ban from China, and they said, yes, we have to stop the Chinese from coming and bringing their Chinese virus, even though it was already here. These were the same people who were saying, oh, my gosh, I can't believe you're banning travel from Africa. How stupid is that? It's already here. Conversely, a lot of the people who said, well, at least they're doing something, they have to ban travel from it because at least they're trying to stop it, were the ones who called Trump's Africa uh, travel ban uh, racist and who were also calling the Chinese travel ban racist. Well, it wasn't necessarily racist. It was just stupid in both times. It's stupid. Um, and that's another division we shouldn't allow is the partisan division. If something's stupid, it's stupid whether Joe Biden does it or Donald Trump does it or Boris Johnson does it or, you know, whoever the, the, the leader of uh, the head of state of Austria is, does it. It's, it's bad policy. If it's bad policy and it doesn't work, then it's bad policy and it doesn't work. And another thing you've been seeing a lot is that in some countries, uh, the protest, the, the way police are dealing with protesters is getting uh, more and more violent for the for the sake of public health, especially I think we've seen in Australia, uh, but in Austria we see that as well. And in the Netherlands, police shot uh, with an actual bullet one of the pro protesters while they're having this uh, ending end the lockdown type of protest in Rotterdam. What do you think about that? Because it. I think of all of the, the restrictions or regulations or whatever the government's doing, those kind of things feel the most dangerous to me because it affects people immediately just at that point. Again, a question to both of you. 
Well, I, I'll let Chris start with this because okay. um, uh, shooting protesters is a tale as old as time in the U.S. So I, I, I'll, <laughs> yeah, I'll, let the per- I'll let the people who are doing rare this here. talk about it. First. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I, yeah, I think as this goes on and the rules and regulations become less and less reasonable, um, the police and the government, for that matter, the government is governing with less and less consent. And as governments lose consent, they will turn more to force and even violence. So, for example, this is nothing like um, the the examples you've given. But in the UK, we've had mass mandates. They got rid of them in in July, except on the London Underground. And fewer and fewer people have been wearing masks on the London Underground to the point where it was like a minority until a couple of weeks ago when they, they brought in the rules generally as like the law. Um, but still a lot of people don't do it. But in the last week or so, police, you know, the Met police have actually been getting on trains and enforcing this. You know, it never happened before. It just happened really with consent. And most people at the height of the pandemic, would, they would they would do it no problem at all. And if a few people didn't do it, then you'd ignore them. We know it doesn't make that much difference, let's face it. But now they're, now they're enforcing it. And the fines are going up. The fine for um, for not isolating not self-isolating when you test positive with the new variant is ten thousand pounds right it's an insane amount of money the fine for not self no it's not fine. the jail sentence for not self-isolating when you come back from abroad or one of the orange or red list countries or whatever it is is 10 years in prison right this is this is because no one's ever going to be given 10 years in prison for this. No, you know? no. It's, but no. it's what happens when the government can't rely on people to follow the rules voluntarily because the people haven't got any respect left for the rules. And what's been happening in the Netherlands with the protests and in Belgium and in Australia, Melbourne, Melbourne's been in lockdown longer than anywhere else in the entire world. Mm. You know, um, I have to say, I can't really blame them. Because in, in countries like that, it, it does feel as if the goalposts keep moving and there's no end in sight for this. And if you give people laws that, you know, deserve to be treated with content, people will treat them with content and people will snap. And I'm well aware that a lot of the people protesting probably I have nothing in common with and a lot of them are just anti-vaxxers or, or whatever. But, you know, at some point... I think that civil disobedience is appropriate. I would never condone violence, but I think civil disobedience, even if it's just kind of passive resistance, is certainly appropriate. I feel we're getting close to that point in Britain, and we're definitely at that point in large parts of Europe and Australia. Yeah, yeah so it, as I was saying before, the uh, the U.S. Uh, has a very interesting way of dealing with protests, which we have many of. Uh, We are almost in a constant state of protest about various things. That's a proud American tradition. Another somewhat proud American tradition is the police shooting those protesters. Um, And so we have uh, a very interesting thing in the in the uh, the the land of the free, as it were, where uh, the protesters are protesting. The police uh, use kettling tactics to uh, isolate and then brutalize those protesters. And by focusing all their police resources on the protesters, they leave the entire rest of whatever that region or municipality or city or whatever is completely vulnerable to looters and and rioters and opportunists. Uh, Those are also the areas that typically have the strictest gun control, which means the only people there that have guns are the criminals and the police, uh, which means that uh, you then have that uh, uh, ancillary violence that happens as a result of the police focusing on the people with the picket signs instead of the people with the guns and the bricks. Uh, and then that they inevitably use that to say, oh, see, this is why we need more police and more money and more co- control and more power. Again, government grandstanding on the suffering that they created to push for even more control. The reason we have that here in the U.S. is because largely the, the two main political camps when it comes to this, you have the people on the left. Uh, and again, I'm speaking very generally and broadly, uh, but you have the, the authoritarians on the left who uh, recognize that government can often be uh, harmful and abusive and inequitable and that its enforcers can often do things in a very abusive way and that they're not being held accountable and that that's wrong. But then they push for more rules and more laws and more orders uh, for these 
same police officers that they often don't like or even hate to enforce, uh, thereby ensuring even more interactions between the police and the public. Uh, and then you have the political right, again, generally speaking, uh, the authoritarian right, who uh, is very much against the actions of government and wants government to be even smaller. And many of them are stockpiling firearms that they unironically say that they're one day going to use uh, in, uh, in fighting against the tyrants. But then when a police officer shoots someone, that, those, that's the first group of people to find an excuse for why that was justified. They, there's almost a, a cult-like worship of what they call the thin blue line. It, it's, it, it, and so in this culture of two camps that you know, are, are kind of mirror images of one another when it comes to the, this issue, it leads to the kind of environment where protests and, and really everything are met with large and almost dictatorial levels of, third, uh, of, of police violence. Like we don't see that kind of ongoing police violence uh, against the general population outside of authoritarian and develop, developing countries. Like we're one of the few first world countries that has this level of police violence on a regular basis. Um, with that being said, when it comes to specifically to these uh, anti-lockdown and anti-mandate protests here and around the world, it's exposing something. Um, government and its enforcers make up less than 1% of a given population. And that varies from country to country, but generally speaking, it's usually less than 1% of the population. If even one or 2% of the population shrugs and says, no, I'm not going to do that. And you'll have to make me, uh, then it becomes effectively impossible for them to enforce that in a real way. We see that constantly with the mask mandates. As Chris was saying, even when it was still mandated on the London Underground, you had one, two, three percent of people who refused to do it, which became five percent, which became ten percent, which you know became the majority. Um, and and we see that with with what you know we see that with uh, cannabis here in the United States. Everyone you know anyone who wanted to smoke cannabis smoked cannabis, and eventually an increasing number of states said, "All right, fine, you can smoke cannabis." And, and we see that with many things. Mass non-compliance, preferably civil, but sometimes it's not civil. Mass non-compliance, when applied consistently, almost inevitably, even after that initial reaction by government of using violence and using force, it almost inevitably leads to government having to relax back and not enforce that thing anymore. Because if they keep trying to enforce it and keep failing, then they eventually have to show that there is no such thing as government power. It's only what we're willing to consent to. And if we're not, they have no real power. So rather than you know, give, up the, uh, give up the paper dragon or paper tiger, they pull back and say, OK, we'll let you do that now. But you still have to do this and this and this and this. So I do think that mass noncompliance, again, preferably civil, uh, but mass noncompliance is going to have to be a major component to keeping the COVID regime at bay. Appreciate that you called preferably civil. Uh... <laughs> I come from the U.S. The, our country was founded on a bloody revolution against law enforcement over a proposed 3% tax on a single product. So, you know, our way of thinking about this is, is maybe slightly different than the general population. Preferably civil. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, and also we see a lot of like Chris said in the beginning, criminalization of protests is very interesting to me. Um, I was reading in Luxembourg where the first time they have actually had a protest against COVID rules and lockdowns. They don't, they, I don't know, I don't think you never see Luxembourg in the news. It's a very peaceful country. And for the first time they actually had some uh, uh, protests. And now in the parliament, they're talking about making protests illegal for the sake of democracy, which seems, to be the funniest joke that could come out of Luxembourg to me. Yes. Well, just just have a just have a Black Lives Matter protest because that seems to get rid of all legal restrictions. I mean, that was really crazy time last year. I'm talking about in Britain. I'm sure Spike can talk about uh, America, but you know, it was what June last year. We were still mm -hmm. deep into lockdown. Our lockdown didn't finish until July last year, and there were protests that were like anti-lockdown protests and the police crack down pretty stiffly on them um and you know all you know, good thinkers were very much of the view that these people were breaking the law and what they were doing was stupid and reckless and it was probably going to lead to a huge spike in cases which actually none of these outdoor protests i think did yeah. and then you get the the blm protests and you had people 
I wrote an article about this. I think it was pub. There were public health people in in the USA saying that you know, admittedly, two weeks ago I was against these these anti lockdown protests because I thought yeah. it was a huge public health threat. But these protests, not only will I look the other way, I'm in totally in favour of them because this, if anything, this is a you know, this is the biggest pu- public issue. A public health issue of our time, racism. And so they, these people actually have a duty to be out there. And that I thought was very, very um, illuminating about the state of the public health industry, I would call it, but, you know, public health lobby at least. It's just, just how political the whole thing is and coming from one particular political um, direction as well. Yeah, we, uh, I will say that the beginning of the end of, uh, public acquiescence to the idea of remaining locked down indefinitely, where we very subtly went from, you know, 14, 15 days to slow the spread to stay in your house until we've eradicated all disease. That ended with the Black Lives Matter protest. Um, and so, I mean, so if nothing else, that I guess that was the positive that happened there was that uh, enough people said, well, but this is OK. And then other people said, well, wait, why is that OK? And then other people said after the protest did not lead to, you know, a, a great number of increase in cases. In fact, there was actually a correlation with a drop, which, again, had nothing to do with whether or not they were protesting. It was the fact that, you know, that wave was finishing up. Uh, and so we saw a drop in cases that made people realize, oh, OK, we can go outside and be around each other again. And that that sort of had to forcibly mainstream it. Um, yes, there was definitely a a. a, a a difference in uh, reaction to the April, eight, March, April, and May anti-lockdown protests and the June, July, and August Black Lives Matter protests in the political realm. In the actual policy realm, our police responded to those protests the way they did the other protests. Uh, the you know kettled and brutalized the protesters while leaving the rest of the city open to rioters and looters. The one exception there. Uh, And yes, I'm an American, so I'm going to make this about guns. The one exception there was the armed protests where the police largely just observed and reported because you don't bring tear gas to a gunfight. And so they uh, we saw that there would be armed protests, both Black Lives Matter protests and anti-lockdown protests, where there'd be a lot of wringing of hands in the media and among the politicians that these people are a threat to our democracy. Everything's a threat to democracy. I love that part. But they're, you know, they're a threat to our safety and democracy. And yet those were the protests where no one got rounded up and put in jail. Uh, no one got uh, brutalized. No one got, uh, uh, you know, there, there weren't any riots or looting because the police largely kept the status quo and didn't focus on just the protesters. Um, and so, you know, that was a, a actually I spoke at a um, a Black Lives Matter and Black Panther protest uh, in Virginia last July. And one of the things I said at the at the protest where I spoke at, I said, you know, here we are in the center of the capital of Virginia. Um, and you'll notice that there isn't a police officer for three blocks there. We had to actually go and try to spot one, um, and even though there's hundreds of us here because most of us are armed. And uh, it was 98 percent black, the people that were there. And so it wasn't, you know, the police were letting us protest because we're white. It's because we're armed or they were armed. And uh, and so that was a, a common thing that I kept saying, again, going back to government doesn't want to. Uh, demonstrate that they don't actually have power. And so anytime there's a real gut check towards government, whether it's a large group of armed people peaceably, pro- again, preferably civilly protesting, uh, or just a large number of people saying, no, I'm not going to do that. You'll have to make me. I'm not going to do it. That usually leads to government having to pull back. But yes, the Black Lives Matter protests were the beginning of the end of this normalization of the idea that we all just had to stay inside forever. Yeah, I mean, the spy obviously makes a very good point about the, the the thin blue line, you know, and these restrictions you're talking about in in Luxembourg and 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 other parts of I mean, they're almost explicitly just against anti restriction, anti lockdown protesters. Because if it was Black Lives Matter or anything else, we had a protest in in the winter during lockdown this year, 
um, a very sad case of a, a, a woman who was um, raped and murdered by, a, as it happened, a, a policeman, off-duty policeman in London. And a lot of people, mainly women, came out to kind of reclaim the streets. Now, they shouldn't have been doing that technically. And there was some really bad PR for the police because they pinned a few, a few of these protesters down. It looked terrible. All yeah. public sympathy was with the protesters. Um, and obviously a lot of public sympathy was Black Lives Matter. But you can imagine all sorts of scenarios in which people would be out protesting or even just having a candle lit vigil, which is effectively what this was. You're not going to get any public support by setting the police on these people. The only public support you're going to get is if they're a bunch of anti-vax conspiracy theorists. But after a while, even if a lot of them are anti-vax conspiracy theorists, if they're against the restrictions... You know, how, 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 how can you as a society um, have a ban on people protesting about not being allowed to protest? You know, so again, you know, as Spike says, you've just got sheer numbers there and it might only be a fraction of 1% of the population in practice, but it's not a good look for the government yeah. to be arresting, let alone shooting people for protesting. Yeah. Yeah. I like how they're saying, you know, we have to stop the protests to save democracy like we have to stop people exercising their freedom of speech to protect our freedoms it would be similar to saying well these people are voting wrong so we're just not going to let them vote to protect democracy of course we have to keep these people from wrong vote um and it, it, it's it, they might as well be saying that i mean the uh, uh, ability to petition your grievances to government publicly and privately is in some cases sometimes more important or at least as important as being able to vote for, you know, this side of the the, the aisle or this side of the aisle. Um, and yet they are flippantly uh, disregarding your uh, ability to do so, even though uh, it has long been established that being outdoors the likelihood of spreading COVID outdoors, again, going back to a consequentialist thing, spreading COVID outdoors almost never happens, um, even in large groups. Just the, the nature of how viruses, uh, uh, inter how they live in the air and, and, you know, indoors is where viruses typically spread. Outdoors, at least for COVID, is very unlikely. Our, our, our CDC uh, very, uh, I think even during last summer said, you don't need to wear a mask if you're outdoors. The, the likelihood of you spreading COVID uh, outdoors is, is next to nil. Um, and so there is no even public health argument to not letting group, large groups of people come together, uh, which is indeed why they have no problem if it's a Joe Biden victory celebration or a Black Lives Matter protest. Um, but what they're saying is that the public health threat isn't that people are large groups of people are together outside the public health threat is that people are saying and advocating against policies that the government insists are necessary to protect us well even if they are necessary to protect us people still have a right to say they're against something government should not be picking winners and losers when it comes to our freedom of speech so in sfl in lord liberty we try to end with a positive note, because that wouldn't be <laughs> as educational. So yes. we, as libertarians, we care about personal responsibility, individual responsibility uh, over what government tell us what we should do. So where do we go from here? What would be your solution? Personal, again, a question to both of you, uh, a way to go. Do you want me to start? Okay, uh, okay so I'll start. I'm going to keep mine specific to the U.S. Um, because I think largely the best way should we should be messaging this, at least in the U.S., is inevitably if I say these things aren't working, the question becomes, OK, then what does work? Um, and I think our issues in the U.S., when it comes to any kind of health issue, including a, a, a pandemic or a virus or whatever else, are related to capacity and supply of healthcare and cost of healthcare. Those are the two big things uh, that uh, were great. We're already an issue in this country, even before COVID uh, and certainly during COVID uh, were greatly exposed even more. And so I have been focusing more and more on the fact that the reason there were so few hospitals and ICU beds is because of policies like 
certificate of need laws and cost plus legislation and, uh, you know, cronyism and protectionism for the existing companies that are providing health services in a given area and all of these things. And kind of using this as, you know, we already had a brittle healthcare system that was very expensive. And this just exposed all those flaws. You know, this was a, a dam that already had cracks all over it. And when the flood came, it, it exposed all of them. Um, and so I, I think that that is where we need to move forward in terms of messaging. Uh, in terms of, you know, um, our, our way of dealing with this, I know I'm trying to stay positive. Um, in, in terms of dealing with the, the in, in terms of rolling back what's already been done instead of allowing it to continue to proceed, I think it's going to be a combination of always having the best ideas and always being brave enough to say them, even in the midst of sometimes massive public opposition to those ideas. It's also going to take mass non-compliance, um, again, preferably civil, uh, that we are you know, saying we're not going to comply with these things. Um, and everyone has to decide what their own you know, personal uh, line is on what they are or are not willing to comply with. All, all of us are complying with various government orders, whether we like it or not. What is it? That, what are our hills that we're willing to or insistent okay. on dying on? Um, I think when we do that, I think a combination of you know, the best messaging, the best ideas, demonstrating libertarian ideas work in ways large and small across the country. Uh, and also in just refusing to comply and working with others who are refusing to comply. I think that eventually government has to recognize that, uh, you know, as Chris said, they're losing the consent of the governed. And unless they want to have to resort to violence, uh, and even after they resort to violence, at some point, they're going to have to pull back to not expose the fact that they don't have any real power. Fair enough. I would say that, um, you know, I think sensible response from people like ourselves over the course of the last 18 months and now a sensible response going forward and getting away from all this and ignoring the, you know, significant minority of people who kind of like lockdowns, really, and the significant minority of people who just can't get their head around the fact that, you know, some people just die and the government must do everything in its power to, to prevent them from dying is to say that we, we've been pragmatic about this. People who believe in liberty and free markets are not anarchists that we've accepted an exceptional once in a hundred year situation like this. There is room for, for government intervention, but it has to be based on serious kind of cost benefit analysis and understanding of negative externalities, not just based on the idea that you know if it saves one life that it's worth doing, because that's not right. that's not true. And the pandemic has raised quite a lot of interesting questions that free market economists actually have answers to, including things like the value of life, the value of human life, and how you how you weigh that in a cost benefit analysis. People don't like talking about that very much because they'd rather kind of virtue signal and just say, well, all human life is priceless. Well, I'm afraid, unfortunately, when it comes to public policy, that has never been the case. I recommend a book by my friend Ryan Bourne at the Cato Institute called Economics in One Virus. And I think it takes a very, very sober and you know, intelligent look at this, looks at where the government has, has made mistakes, but also where the government, in this instance at least, has been able to be useful in some way and and looks at you know where, where things have gone wrong and right certainly things have gone wrong in many ways and there's been a failure of government to think on the margin to introduce laws that had no they had no real benefit to them at all for, for example gathering outdoors as as spikes just said the, the 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 risk of transmission is so small why why were we banning people from going fishing on their own during lockdown you know yeah. um yeah. so it's this kind of thing let's you know think like an economist um and it will really get you a long way so i hope that you know I'm, I'm very proud actually of the way that people i know in the free market think tank world have responded to the to the pandemic nearly all of them have kind of accepted that this is an instance where we need government action but there's also been so many instances and so many examples showing where government regulation and government in general goes too far um, there have been a whole raft of measures in the USA, for example. Um, governments rush to overturn a whole load of regulation because when push comes to shove, it wasn't really needed and it was actually hindering things. For one small example, loads of states I know 
Um, they they had to uh, uh, get rid of their laws banning the delivery of alcohol by by mail. True. Like, why why were they ever in there? There's plenty of things these these regulations that were never actually needed. Governments, when push comes to shove, and they really need to get things done, they had to cut a swathe through red tape and regulation, including, I have to say, on, on, on things like the vaccines to some extent, and certainly when it yes. came to recruiting new medics and all this kind of stuff. Why was this stuff ever there in the first place? Exactly. It wasn't there clearly to protect public health. It wasn't there for economic efficiency. It was there for oh, all sorts of different reasons and then special interests and rent-seeking. So in many respects, the pandemic has shown what we've been saying all along, which is actually there's far too much red tape and bureaucracy and uh, and uh, and government intervention for me then i have my last question for both of you um if you had the power to change one thing about covid policies around the world what would it be is this from the beginning or like right now if if we suddenly now we can now, if, we... yeah you can do okay. it you can also like you can end the government kind of thing but like I, <laughs> no because i'm no yeah end the government all just <laughs> um i mean that's might be the most effective single thing um i was gonna say if it was from the beginning i probably would have uh voted against uh, uh or, or said we we're not gonna fund uh gain of function research by Echo Health Alliance in Wuhan, China. But the um, uh, when it comes to, you know, today, uh, what uh, it, it, the single thing we, we don't get to just say in government. Um, I, so I, I guess if I had to pick one single policy aspect, um, it's hard to pick a single. I guess the one thing I would do is reframe this as we are talking about personal health choices mm -hmm. and you know, to whatever extent we we look at the value of incentivizing public health choices, like some states have, you know, you get a lottery ticket if you if you if you get vaccinated or you get one hundred dollars or five hundred dollars or whatever you get back. You know, if if we're going to decide that government needs to be involved in trying to get people vaccinated, for example, going that route instead of going the we're going to segregate society based on whether or not you're vaccinated route. Um, but that, you know, ultimately we are incentivizing public health. We are inc incentivizing personal health decisions that we believe are good ones, as opposed to saying, because we're quote unquote, all in this together, that means that everyone's going to suffer if this person does this bad thing that, you know, that, that even, even though that's not actually the fact, you know, you can get the vaccine and you can still get the virus. You can still spread the virus. It's a personal health choice if you want to get it and, and be less likely to get sick or hospitalized or die as a result of it. So I think that's probably the single change I would make is reframing all of this as how do we incentivize or do we even incentivize good personal health choices instead of saying, how do we deal with this public catastrophe that is, you know, reliant on all of us making the exact same decisions? I, I don't know if this is the biggest mistake. There's so many, really. Um, I, I wrote a whole uh, p uh, report, actually, for the Institute of Economic Affairs about the, the mistakes made by the World Health Organization and by Public Health England, the latter of which has since been dissolved, largely because of these mistakes. I think I'd just point to a kind of a scientific mistake. I mean, a lot of it has come from trusting the wrong experts. I think I think virologists and vaccine developers and quite a few epidemiologists have had a pretty good pandemic. But the run of the mill public health person, usually a fairly low IQ group think kind of guy or girl, has had a shocking time. And I include the WHO in that. So the, the, the one I'd pick would be this denial of what seemed even to an armchair epidemiologist like me, obvious fact very early on that this was an airborne virus. The WHO just said, no, it's not airborne. Keep washing your hands. Keep right. wiping these surfaces. I mean, this stuff made almost no difference whatsoever to the transmission. They were they were against the face masks as well. I'm not a big believer that face masks are like, yeah, the the, the thing to really suppress a virus, but they were right. against them, <laughs> you know, actively telling people not to wear face masks, just keep washing your hands, because basically they thought it was they thought it was a flu, you know, same as the anti-vaxxers have done since um so yeah the world health organization has had a shocking time um it is at the very least incompetent and i think very largely corrupt uh it 
it continues to be useless. It's been useless before. It's useless on things like e-cigarettes, which it spent the early part of the pandemic ranting about even then. Um, it needs to be, and I'm, this is one thing I think Trump got right, it needs to be defunded and needs to be replaced by a serious organization that is actually interested in uh, in infectious diseases because the, the WHO isn't. The WHO is obsessed with the same kind of thing that Western public health intellectuals are obsessed with, which is you know, tr relatively trivial uh, lifestyle issues um, in Western countries. As an American libertarian, the second biggest and most important thing we can do is to end the ATF. Cool. So you kind of agree at the end of it. Well, what are the things we should get rid of? That is cool. Yes. That's the perfect circle to end our uh, live session today. Thank you very much for joining Spike Cohen, Chris Snowden, and I'm your host, yours truly, Nelson John. Um, hope to see you in our physical events soon when we are back to normal. Uh, yes. But thank you again for being part of it and answering my questions. Thank, thank you, Nasla. Thank you for having us. Have a good time.